Okay, so Tara, welcome back to the show. And I haven't seen and spoken to you, so a happy 2024. And let's Thank just you. jump. <laughs> you're welcome. Let's jump right into it. So apparently, Trump is not immune from prosecution. <laughs> Trump's lawyers were essentially shut down by the DC Circuit Court of Appeals on Tuesday. So my question to you, Tara, is how do you predict that the court will ultimately rule on this issue? Well, unlike you, I am not a lawyer, but I play one on TV sometimes. Um, and, you know, I've been watching this and, and, and listening to the legal advice of people a lot smarter and more well versed in this than I am. But just from a common sense perspective, I don't see after the way those judges questioned Donald Trump's defense team, I don't see how they rule in favor of saying, yeah, you're right. The president can do whatever he wants. Yep. Immunity, full immunity. Um, if he wants to assassinate a political opponent while in office, nope, he can't be prosecuted unless he's impeached and convicted. That just seems so beyond the pale uh, of any kind of legal precedent or history in this country that I, I don't see them ruling in favor of what Donald Trump's team wants. Now, is there a possibility there could be some type of limited immunity? Maybe very narrow. Um, you know, they uh, others have, have given examples of what that could possibly be. But what Donald Trump's team is looking for, I don't see that happening. I mean, it was really I'm still reeling, actually, from that exchange between Judge Pan and Donald Trump's lawyer, where she backed John, him into the yeah, corner. John Sauer. Yeah. First of all, what was that voice? It was it was horrible. Does he always sound like that? I don't that know. It just... sounds to me like he just came off smoking like 12 packs of <laughs> cigarettes, but it almost sounds to me like he has some sort of vocal cord paralysis or yeah. vocal cord nodules that need to be taken care of. Now, to those of you who may be saying, Michael, you're not a doctor. You shouldn't be. Yeah, it's true. But my father was an ENT, a diplomat in head and neck reconstructive surgery and an ears, nose and throat. Um, you know, uh, specialist. And so uh, <laughs> I've seen many people come yeah. in and out of the office, you know, when I was a kid, uh, you know, with that sort of voice and there's something not right there. No. And it made it, it just made it, I only bring it up because it made it difficult to listen to. I, yeah, you know, I was it was cringing. an audio recording. Yeah. It was, right? I'm like, Oh my gosh. Um, but anyway, so yeah, she backed him into a corner there on that, scenario where she said, you know, if if the president commands the Navy, you know, gives an order to the Navy SEALs to assassinate a political opponent, is it was a yes or no. And he basically said, well, yeah, you know, quali a qualified yes, but no, it was. Yeah, it what, was is that, what does that even mean, Tara? I you mean, tell me, I you're the lawyer. I, I, don't, I don't know. I've never heard anybody <laughs> ever use that terminology. A qualified yes, a qualified yeah. yes to a question that's predicated around the president assigning a hit squad <laughs> against a political opponent or an adversary by SEAL Team Six. I mean, I, I'm, I'm. Oh yeah, stunned. it's like something out of a movie. It's something out of a novel. You know, um, you couldn't script this stuff, and and but yet here we are. This is real life. This is real legal uh, precedent about to be set and this was an actual legal argument used in a very real case that has broad implications beyond the just Donald Trump and his nonsense here that we're facing legally. So I uh I I felt pretty good about the way the judges responded to their their defense because it was just so outrageous. However, I've I've been in federal circuit court hearings and you never know. The questioning doesn't necessarily mean it's reflective of how they're going to rule. I've seen that happen uh, when I was a congressional staffer in some cases that I worked on. I thought it was going great for our side. And then the ruling came out and it was not so great. So, you know, you never know. I think in this instance, it's a little more cut and dry, but you just never know. You know I, do I, hope you, I, don't, yeah. I don't think so. I hate to say it, Tara. I don't think it's cut and dry in any case. When I went before the Second Circuit, the three panel judges um, on the lawsuit that I brought against the United States of America, Donald Trump, Bill Barr for the unconstitutional remand. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is the first judge, Judge uh, Lyman, who's part of, he's with the district court, um, turned around and his comment was, this is really messed up and 
I agree with Judge Alvin K. Hellerstein that this was retaliatory. The problem, though, is that with the overturning of the Dobbs decision, it also overturned the case of Bivens. And Mm. Bivens is the case that is used when you are suing the United States government for violating your rights. Okay. The Second Circuit attacked, literally, this one, uh, I think his name was Judge Barrington Parker. And Judge Parker was straight up perfect when he was attacking government and saying, well, what is the deterrence to stop a president, a former president, or government official from ever doing this again? And, right. And the Southern District um, attorney, I think it was like O'Shaughnessy or something like that, she turns around and she goes, well, he could always avail himself of the administrative remedies by the Bureau of Prisons, to which, if anybody knows what that is, it, to get from a BP-9 to a BP-12 so that you could actually bring a lawsuit, it takes about two years. And you're asking the group of people who incarcerated you to acknowledge that they did it right. under improper pretenses. So he says, yeah, yeah Bureau, I don't think, forget it. <laughs> exactly. So he says, I don't, I don't buy that. So what, what else, what else you got? Because that's a ridiculous argument. She goes, well, like what Mr. Cohen did, you could avail yourself of a motion for a writ of habeas corpus. And as Mr. Cohen was successful, that case could be used by others in order to offset incarceration. So he goes, yeah. but they'll already have been incarcerated if they need to file this writ of habeas corpus. So she was like, um, um, um Was this a three judge panel or was it judge, only it was three the, judge yeah. panel? And it yeah. was all three judges ruled that the overturning of the Bivens case precluded me from bringing this action. Even though, even though under what's called the Egbert case, this case, which was um the decision was by Justice Clarence Thomas. Mm, lucky you. He's well, <laughs> he left a, he left an opening, which is what we were taking. Yeah. Unless it is of the most unusual circumstance. And one of the questions we asked the three judge panel, name another circumstance. And Judge Parker said the same thing. Can you name another circumstance that would be more unusual than the president of the United States weaponizing the Department of Justice against a critic and violating their First Amendment right in order to remand them back to prison. And nobody had an answer. And Alina Haba was funny. They gave her one and a half minutes to speak, and Mm. she didn't even know the blasting game case, which just came out. And so the judge was like, I think we've heard enough from you. Yeah, so she was. Wasn't po- she like a parking garage attorney or something? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, she's no rocket scientist. No. However, the reason I bring this all up for my listeners is that you understand that the comments that were just made by John Sauer, attorney for Donald, at this hearing, it validates what I've been screaming from the rooftop for two years now, which is that. If Trump re-enters the White House, becomes the 47th president, that there will be no one who is safe. Not you, Tara, not me, not members of the Supreme Court, not district court judges that ruled against him, not Congress members like Moskowitz or Raskin or any of the other members that aren't kissing his ass like Jim Jordan or Marjorie Toilet Green. They will all have. The, they will all have a possibility that SEAL Team 6 knocks down their door and arrests them because that's what the president told them to do. Well, a couple of things about that. Um, SEAL Team 6, six can't arrest, right? But they can assassinate. 
um, and you're that's kind of what they do. I mean, they're special, they're highly specialized. Now, not on American soil. Posse Comitatus doesn't allow this, but um, Donald Trump said he wants to tear up the Constitution. So mm -hmm. none of the constitutional guardrails that are in place to protect Americans from an, an authoritarian government would apply anymore if Trump came in. He's already found ways now to try to, you know, use the Insurrection Act and they've telegraphed what they want to do with this Project 2025 stuff. And he has these these acolytes who their entire lives are sitting around looking at ways that they can, you know, manipulate you know, loopholes in, in the law or constitutionally to try to do these things. How do we know this? Well, they tried it with January 6th and trying to overturn the government in a free and fair election. So Donald Trump is telling us what they plan to do. The people around him that he's surrounding himself with are people who are bad, bad actors, bad people who actually don't believe in our constitutional republic, despite all of their bullshit about, you know, the flag and patriotism and all of that. No, no, they're trees. They're treasonous traitors. They are authoritarian wannabes and they can't wait. They can't wait to exact their revenge on all the people who um, who spoke out against them before. Now, the other thing, too, this news about Roger Stone and talking about assassinating Eric Swalwell and Congressman uh, Jerry Nadler should send shivers down people's spines because, again, these are people in proximity to Trump that feel as though the law doesn't apply to them. And Roger Stone and Steve Bannon and the rest of the ilk in that that MAGA extremist wing of the party, they all they, they get off on this stuff. They get off on it and they have people out here who are willing to possibly execute it. How do we know? Well, January 6th, again, the Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, the Boogaloo Boys, like yep, the there Oath are Keepers. Yep. the Oath Keepers, like there are groups out there and there are tens and th tens of thousands of these people who are out there ready to be activated. Look what happened in Michigan with Governor Whitmer and their attempted kidnapping and murder of her. The FBI. The Department of Homeland Security, counterterrorism experts have all testified that domestic terrorism is the number one threat right. to the United States. And yes. these are people, there's a right wing element to this that people seem to, I don't know if they're in denial or what, but we but, see it every day. Sure. Look what happened with look what happened over the weekend with Judge Chutkin yep. getting swatted. What's happening to Jack Smith? As a matter of fact, Rick Wilson at the Lincoln Project was part of this coordinated effort to SWAT people uh, over the last couple of days. 4 a.m., he woke up to 15 members of the SWAT team of his county police department swarming his house. These are intimidation tactics that domestic terrorists are using that are MAGA extremists that Donald Trump is sitting back and enjoying what he's watching because he believes these are people who will who will be his his uh, executioners when it, it time comes if he ever gets back into power? Yes, but but Tara, let me say this: Donald has a much bigger plan here than these rogue paramilitary guys that want to be right. Wannabes, right. The, what they do is they buy all the gear from Dick Sporting Good. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. They go out, they <laughs> grab their beer, right. They go out with the cooler and a you know, bunch of the AR-15 rifles into these you know, pre-made location, someone's backyard, yeah, right. and they start running drills, rolling in the dirt, doing no, somersaults. Cosplaying. Right, yeah, uh. exactly. That's not who Donald Trump wants. Donald Trump's intent, and you nailed it when you said Donald's own words. Don't don't listen to Michael Cohen. Don't listen right. to Tara Setmayer. If you want to know who Donald Trump is, listen to him. Listen to what he's telling you that he is going to do, who he is, and so on. Not only is he going to tear up the Constitution, he also wants to destroy the tripartite system. I talk about it on almost every show. Yes. He wants to do away with, the, with Congress, with the judiciary, and he wants to um, do away with the legislative branch. Therefore, yes. Congress will have no ability the judiciary will have no ability to stop him. This lawsuit that the uh, Southern District Attorney was talking about will not be of any consequence because there will be no judiciary. It will be all whoever Donald Trump puts in, and he will be the ultimate arbiter of every single matter 
because there will be no judiciary. That's what he wants. All power yes. to be conferred to him. This he is has the problem. Said it, so Michael. when he said right, so when he puts in people like a Michael Flynn or other um, individuals who will have to take that loyalty pledge to him and Stephen Steven, Miller or Steve Miller yeah. or or Steve Bannon or you're going to get uh, what's his name uh, Jason Miller. You're going to get Ugh. all these guys, right? All of them, and he's going to then turn around have 1,600, 2,000 people who took loyalty pledges. And he says to the guy who's going to be running the military, I want you to send SEAL Team 6 over to so-and-so's home. I don't want you to kill him. I want you to bag him and tag him, and we'll figure out what we're going to do with him. Maybe we'll make a public execution out of it. And I know people are saying, stop it. That just sounds like a bad fucking episode of house of cards this is the right. reality this and, is why i'm know, yelling it's true you know what michael like people if the, if you were to just come down as an alien and see like where we're at right now and what we're talking about you'd be like wait what is this real but here's the thing you see the what's on social media what's in the, the the dark web here with these with these Trump supporters and the imagery that they put out there. We saw parts that we saw this during the 2020 election as well, where they have these weird anime uh, like cartoons with Trump as this like pumped up got Rambo type guy. And you have them, you know, members of Congress simulating murdering other members of Congress and like these really violent images that are supposed to project strength, violence and bloodshed. And, you know, the cruelty is the point they are showing us this is the stuff that they like this is what they would this is their fantasy of what they would like to do and if you have donald trump in power they get to live this out because he likes that kind of shit too he's a sick fuck and he shows us this every day how deranged he is and i just don't know that the american people fully grasp this and that's part part of our challenge this year going into 2024 is really showing people how deranged this guy is because it's beyond just being incompetent or ignorant or an ignoramus or uh, uh, obnoxious it's deranged in a very sick twisted and violent way similar to people like kim jong-un or saddam hussein or putin who get off on bloodshed torture and and seeing their enemies suffer donald trump is that is cut from that same mold and he's showing us this all the time. But I think we've become a little desensitized to it because the media ignores it or they just go, oh, that's just the crazies over there. No, the crazies have a seat at the table now. They've been mainstreamed. And I don't know how we break through this, but we're damn sure gonna try and keep pointing it out and keep making the comparisons between Joe Biden. Yeah, okay, he's a little old. Yep, he might stutter. Versus Donald Trump, who's also old and a sick, crazy person who's deranged enough to want to completely undermine what makes this country great. Donald Trump hates America. Trump's Trump's people, Trumpism hates America. That's what frustrates me so much about and this, yet, that they if, claim if that look, they're patriots. Right, that no, they, they're not. They, every one of them has on their social media platform that they're all part, either they're veterans or uh, you know that they're somehow Second Amendment. Let, let me ask you this question. Why, in your opinion, has Elise Stefanik, and I had an opportunity to meet her. Why has Ugh. she gone so far to the right? I mean, going so far as to calling the J6 rioters who have been jailed hostages. They are not hostages. And the no. use of that term, when we're watching what's going on in Israel with, the, with Hamas and the holding yes. of hostages, right? Mm -hmm. They are not, under any definition, hostages. Because no. I think you've said, and I quote, he sold every ounce of her soul. My question to you, Tara, for what? <laughs> for power and relevance. I've said this before, and I mean, I can't understand that because I don't have the type of personality where I'd be willing to sell everything out just to get affirmation or adulation or to feel relevant. I don't know, maybe her dad didn't hug her enough when she was a kid. Maybe she didn't get enough credit when she did th something well. You know, maybe she was the ugly duckling and people made fun of her. So now this is her way of, of, of coming out and saying like, see, I'm better than you, I can do it. Who knows? I mean, there's, there's all kinds of 
of of uh, psychological reasons that that drive people to do what they do. But the the long and short of it is people like her, like Lindsey Graham, you know, like Nancy Mace, who's another one that I have zero tolerance for. And I just want to tell her to shut up because she just is so performative and hypocritical. And another one preening, trying to get attention. See, look at me, look at me. I want attention. I want attention. I was a backbencher and now I'm not. And I'm gonna, you know, I'm I'm trying to be the new Miss MAGA of of Congress. Like Elise Stefanik, Nancy Mace, Lauren Boebert, like all these people, Marjorie Taylor Greene, they all have different motivations for it, uh, what drives them. But the bottom line is the common denominator is power and relevance. Same thing with Kellyanne Conway. We, we talked about this the last time I was on. She's someone else who knows better, who's smart, who had a career, who had a nice family, who gave it all up, threw it all away to become one of the biggest shills and hypocrites of the entire Trump era. And for what? It cost her her family. It cost her her reputation. And why? Because she had proximity to power in the White House? Well, she she mentioned it. She you know, she she came from a single family home. So obviously she she was looking for the attention of a man. She lost. She did not have the love of her father. Mm. So this was her way of of looking at Donald Trump as some father figure, which is, you know, I mean, she's not the only one. A lot of other people look at him in this weird way, too. And that's I'll leave that up to the psychologist to figure that out. But why do they do this? I mean, Elise Stefanik is Harvard educated for fuck's sake. She's not a dummy. But she made a calculated decision to go this route. When she first came into Congress, she was the youngest member of Congress, a female member of Congress, a Republican. And there was all this promise for her. She was a moderate. She was going to help bridge the divides. And, you know, she was part of that new crop of, of, of moderate Republicans. And now she's like Ava Braun level. I called her Baghdad mm. Bob and Heels. What are you doing? You're going on national media saying with a straight face that January 6th convicted felons domestic terrorists who attacked the building she was in where she was cowering in a corner scared yep. for her life on that day calling those people hostages it, it it is it is outrageous and then to turn it around and make it seem and say it with such authority as if we're all the assholes for questioning her it's outrageous but we have to push back on it you have to push back i i wish kristen welker had pushed back more on her I like Kristen. I think she's an excellent journalist. I don't know that she's suited out for the anchor chair for that show necessarily, but she, they've got to push back on it. You know, if a Mehdi Hassan or a stronger interviewer was interviewing Elise Stefanik, who she would never have the courage to go in front of because she knows they wouldn't let her get away with it, but they would have fact-checked her on the spot and nailed her on that. Well, I'm sorry. You, did, you are a big supporter of Israel, so you're telling me that the January 6th uh, prisoners are equivalent to the hostages right. in in that were taken by Hamas. They were brutally taken by against their will. It's a tortured. shame. It's a shame she did a great yeah. job when she was speaking with the MIT um, University yeah. of Pennsylvania and Harvard, you know, presidents and on put them issue. on the spot on that right. issue. She was yeah. right on. But you're right to call, I mean to call them hostages. What I an do affront! Want to say, it is an affront. And, and not only to them, by the way, not only an affront to people who are actual hostages around the world and people who have been taken hostage, um, but what an affront to law enforcement. I mean, the, all mm -hmm. those law enforcement officers who were there defending the Capitol, putting their lives on the line to defend ungrateful motherfuckers like her, to turn around and disrespect their service and their sacrifice to protect them by claiming that those people who are now paying the price for breaking the law are hostages? I mean, I, I, most people who follow me know I come from a law enforcement family. My grandfather was a police officer for 40 years, captain of my hometown police department. My my husband is a federal law enforcement aid, uh, agent, 23 years. How dare she? And I don't understand why people in the law enforcement community aren't protesting in, in her home office or her office in Congress, telling her to apologize to them for making those comments. How dare she? How because dare any of them, them allowing that? Many of them are the same people that seem to be backing Trump, who was actually the guy who told everybody to storm the Capitol. I'll meet you there. And instead, yeah. they are out there, you know, <laughs> again, I can't figure out what the reason for backing for backing Trump is. It To me, again, it's baffling and I'll never understand it.
So me either. Let me, yeah. So let me ask you this then, because Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell was once yeah. he was once this all powerful member, but now when asked about Trump, he responds, and I'm going to quote: "I choose not to get involved and comment and comment." about any of the people running for the Republican nomination. Seriously, since when? Since when does Mitch McConnell not have something to say? Well, you know, Mitch McConnell, his best days are behind him. That's obvious. And there was a time, you're right, where Mitch McConnell was the one of the most powerful people in Washington. He ran the Senate a very tight ship. He was very good at Senate brinkmanship and understood the rules and knew how to get things done. Mitch McConnell has been emasculated by Trump, the Trump era politics of the GOP, like many others. I mean, I don't think he's seen his balls in 20 years at this point, but at least not in the last seven since Trump has been around. He is incapable of taking a stand and pushing back. And I think it has to do with a few things. I think because he's past his prime, he just doesn't have the energy. He's just trying to sail into the sunset and retire eventually. He doesn't want to deal with the death threats and the and the questions and the, you know, the the bombardment by Trump crazies that people who speak out against Trump, that I mean, that's what we get. It's, go, it's par for the course at this point. Not everybody is willing to do that. And he's a coward, like many of the rest of them. So when Nancy Mace gets out there and, and and screams about Hunter Biden in a hearing and asks him where are his balls, she needs to turn around and ask that about every single person in the Republican Party who's been unwilling to stand up to Donald Trump and is trying to uh, watch the deterioration of this country as a result of it. And Mitch McConnell's a perfect example. He freaking knows better. He knows. And he has very strong opinions about Donald Trump in private. Believe me, we know. We have people in those circles still that are Republicans that still deal in Senate world, Mitch McConnell's, you know, lackeys who are out there, Josh Holmes and all them. They can't stand Donald Trump. They hate his guts. They call him every name in the book in private, but they're too cowardly to stand up and say it in public. Every opportunity they've had. Could you imagine if Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy and, you know, all the other Republican luminaries who were in positions of power and influence had s- collectively stood up to Trump years ago, we wouldn't be here now because there would be a permission structure within the party for everyone to say what they really feel about Donald Trump because they know it. And he would he would still be an outlier. But yeah. but, you know, they're not. But they won't because they're could cowards you imagine, and they're enablers. Could you imagine? I mean, first of all, I find. Nancy Mace, I find the Republicans, their comments to be so abhorrent. First of all, Hunter Biden did, doesn't work for the government, right? And right. He's a obviously, it's a, he's a private citizen. And so, yeah, you know, he wants to come in and testify, but he wants to do it publicly. In public. He right. wants there right. to be transparency. That's what this whole charade was about. And then Nancy Mace. Um, you know, to get up there and to say, you know, where are your balls? What he should have said is for a Broadway show ticket, you know, they could be in Lauren Boebert's hands. I mean, (laughs) he should have said something, right? Because you can't let these fuckers get away with it. You know, I know. You know what else he could have said? He could have said, well, you know exactly where they are since your colleague showed pictures of of my uh, (laughs) naked body to the entire Congress. So clearly, you know where they are, sweetheart. Right. Uh, (laughs) You know, I mean, like, you've seen them. There's so many things. You've seen them up, uh, right? Close and personal. But yeah, which is is also a disgusting display, by the way. It is trash. And on top of that, look, Hunter's been very vocal about his yes. um, his drug addiction. And yep. so to make fun of somebody who's overcoming a drug addiction, because oh, every trash. one of us, every single one of us knows somebody who has died of yep. drug addiction, drug overdose. I lost two, two of my closest friends, my oldest friends in the world, to overdose. This isn't a joke. You don't make That's fun right. of somebody who's working hard. What about the pain that Joe Biden has gone through in his mm-hmm. life? The loss mm-hmm. of his wife and his 
child and so on. And, you know, and then the second one over with cancer. And then he has one, you know, he has another child and this one has a drug addiction and managed to hold the family still together while yes. still remaining right uh, in, in Congress. And at the same time, then become vice president. And then on top of that, becoming president and accomplishing the things that he's doing. So I yes. think that and still report. standing by his son as right. a loving father. I have said this many times before that the way Joe Biden has handled Hunter Biden's addiction struggles is I from at least publicly from what we know and and from people I know who know the Bidens, you know, privately privately. They love their son and they, it has broken their hearts that he has gone through this. And they've done everything they can to be there for him, to let him know that they love him un unconditionally. And Joe Biden is, the, I, I know that there are probably a lot of uh, addicted individuals out here struggling that wish they had a mom and dad like, like Joe Biden and Jill Biden to love them through it, you know? And it's like to watch Republicans just cast that aside and try to excoriate uh, Joe Biden for being a loving father is just, it's so despicable. It's heartless. And again, it goes back to cruelty. There's just no decency in this party anymore. There's none. No. There's none. You go from the party of, you know, the, the Bushes, where George W. Bush would never walk into the Oval Office without a, a, a suit jacket and tie on. Or as, as Rick Wilson tells a story about how Dick Cheney fired someone because they were rude to another staffer <laughs> like uh probably people are like dick cheney but yeah i mean they didn't tolerate indecency you know where that smallest things like that to to this now to this yeah. the, the the moral decay is really quite remarkable and i'm sure there'll be volumes written about it but it's almost like gladiator you know it's like roman times where pe these people like they you know pile into the coliseum to watch people getting torn apart by animals and cheer it on, even though they know it's cruel and depraved. That's what kind Trump of like wants. what we're, we're in. That's right. That's the political environment we're in now that Republicans thrive off of. Something and very I, and the sick about problem, that. It is. And the thing that I have a lot of concerns about are the Democrats who now say that they will not vote for President Biden because he supports Israel's right to defend themselves. And this is extremely alarming to me. Right, because I've actually heard people say that, you know, mm -hmm. I I am taken back by these individuals, and I try to explain to them what's your alternative, Donald Trump. You really right. think that Donald Trump is going to support Israel's right to defend itself? In fact, Trump is clearly in bed. With Mohammed bin Salman, he'll, he's clearly would be in bed on any given day with Xi Jinping, with um, you know, with uh, you know, Orban. Well, whoever has the Mohammed, most money, right? right whoever has the most Trump. money, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Cause it's about money and his deals and his own, you know, weirdo obsession with these people who have uh, unmitigated power, and this this whole idea that Donald Trump is some champion of Israel because he moved the embassy is that was part of the the calculus here that the, the people around him who are smarter than him knew you do this you've got the the christian vote locked in you have you know the the, the evangelicals and the republicans who are all pro-israel this the, they'll always go back to that as something that you did so just do it donald trump doesn't give a fuck about where the embassy is or what the implications are or what the dynamics are in the middle east he has please Tara, so, can I can I interrupt yeah. you for one second? Yeah. Because I was actually there at the White House during a Hanukkah party at the White House, standing right next to Sheldon Adelson and his wife. And I have nothing bad to say about them at all, other than the fact that the deal had nothing to do with keeping the evangelicals and stuff. It was a cash offer deal. Mm. Sheldon Adelson was going to pay to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to, Jeru to Jerusalem because that's what he wanted to happen. And he offered to pay for the whole thing. And so <sighs> all you got to do is like Trump, you, it's, it's like a, um, a donkey with a carrot instead of right. Donald with a, right. with, with a dollar bill in front of his nose that he can't reach and he'll run in circles for it. 
That's outrageous. what happened. This had That's nothing outra- to do it's outrageous with helping and unsurprising. Israel. It had nothing well, to do with it. It was a cash deal. Yeah, well, I'm sure his political advisors also said this is a smart thing to do. The people who recognize that the long game here on that, it was a smart thing to do on top of whatever cash incentive <laughs> Trump might have had to do it. Um, but it, it, it's, you know, it's just, it's so infuriating because I was on MSNBC the other day and this issue came up and I was on Joy Reid's show and um, I don't agree with her position on what's happening with Israel and Hamas and Gaza. Um, and, you know, we come from different points of view on that. But uh, Biden was at Mother Emanuel in South Carolina. He gave a great speech there and he was interrupted by these protesters mm-hmm. and pro-Palestinian protesters. And they were shouted down by congregants in 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 the church and a woman yelled out, you know, jo- uh, Joe Biden is a good man. He's a good man. And we want him four more years. And and President Biden handled it with grace. He handled it. He didn't say to people, knock the hell out of those people. He didn't say, throw them out. He didn't call them names. He handled it with grace and dignity because he is a good and decent man. And it's a complicated freaking issue. And I warned Democrats, and in this, and in this instance, it was black Democrats, but all any Democrats that think that by staying home or voting third party is somehow going to teach Joe Biden a lesson or it's somehow going to change policy. No, it isn't. You throwing a political temper tantrum over not getting 100% of what you want on one specific issue is not going to advance the cause at all. Not for you, not for the rest of the country, not for anyone who believes in a free and fair America because Donald Trump is the alternative. So you wanna sit home, throw your little temper tantrum and you think you're gonna punish Joe Biden, no. You're going to punish yourselves and the rest of the country because it will allow Donald Trump to win again. Who wants to have a Muslim ban? Who thinks that immigrants are vermin? Who uh, wants to tear up the Constitution? Who wants to be a dictator and has fantasies of that? Who wants to have you know sleepovers with Kim, uh, you know Kim Jong Un and Putin and you know all the other dictators of the world and and you know and and have their own little dictator parties? Like he wants to th- take rights away. He doesn't care about people of color. He doesn't care about equality. He doesn't care about the, the, you know, America becoming a more perfect union. Donald Trump is a clear and present danger to our way of life. Yeah. And so you're going to sit home because Joe Biden doesn't, doesn't fully agree with you on an, on an issue that is 5,000 miles away. Really? Or because you yeah. didn't get your student loan forgiven or because you don't stop being well, so the damn student selfish. Loan, the student loan forgiveness was not because of Biden. It was because. No, I know, the but they don't. I know, but they right. don't associate that. You know what I mean? Right. Or because inflation, you know, went up a couple points as a result of of you know COVID and Trump and all of that. But people don't they don't they they have short attention spans, and unfortunately, the president gets the blame. So that's what you're going to do. People need to wake up yep. and look at the bigger picture and stop this shit because so, it Karen, really is the future of America or Donald Trump's America. Because I COVID, sure as hell don't want to live in Donald Trump's America. I certainly won't. But let me ask you this, Tara. You hear certain pundits saying that President Biden has lost the black vote. First of all, do you think that that's true? And if so, why? Because I was just in Florida. And I, I tell you, I was a little nervous. I was in Palm Beach, right? I went <laughs> to go visit I, was, I went to go visit my parents um, yeah. who, who live in that area. And I was concerned. No. To the contrary, I went with my folks over to Costco and pick up some water and some stuff. <laughs> and there were a whole slew of people. And all of a sudden, they're like, wait, that's Michael Cohen. That's Michael Cohen. And then there was um, this one uh, black gentleman who was sitting there by the hearing aid section. Right? Mm-hmm. I guess he was trying to get a battery or something. Yeah. Um, I started talking to him. His daughter goes to Dartmouth and he's all decked out in Dartmouth gear, hat, shirt. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he clearly was, I I believe he was a Wall Street guy himself. Um, Mm -hmm. But he grabbed a hold of my hand and he was like, you you keep beating the shit out of that bastard. And then there was Mm -hmm. a woman that was standing next to him of no relation who turned around and said the same thing. Bring him down, bring him down. But 
I got more people coming over to me. Now there were a couple people that said, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't care what you say. Uh, I'm a Trump supporter. And I said, okay, good for you. But yeah. I don't believe it's true what they're saying about the black vote. And if I can just say one last thing yeah. before I ask you to answer it, think about Trump's most recent statement about the Civil War that oh, that Lincoln. Right. It took too long. He didn't know what he was doing. He could have resolved the Civil War in 24 hours. Now, the only way that you could have stopped the Civil War in 24 hours would have been to capitulate to the South. Right. Plain and simple. Meaning, yes. meaning he's pro slavery. So, well. How was it Are possible? you shocked at that? Um, <laughs> I'm not shocked at that. Look at the no. You, I mean, come on, Michael. You know how you know Trump's history with with people of color. His entire, I mean, his from his father being a racist to him being a racist to being sued for race racial discrimination to the way he treated black employees in his casinos to the way he responded to the Central Park Five. Well, I mean, all of those his long history of comments and behavior concerning people of color, except for the ones that, you know, were performative for him, athletes or, you know, mm -hmm. boxers or football players or who he looked at as not being as smart, but they were entertaining or had money. So, you know, Donald Trump is a freaking racist. He's a bigot, always has been. And I think that he, I think he thinks that, yeah, the civil, you could ne negotiate the freedom of human beings that you thought were lesser than. I mean, that is an insane statement. And the fact that he would he would denigrate one of the greatest presidents to ever walk the earth in President Lincoln, who was able to navigate that civil war and was able to finally defeat the, the, the Confederacy and black Americans getting rights in this country and were free from slavery. Now it took a hundred years to get full rights, but still you gotta start somewhere. Um, the fact that, that that Donald Trump would make comments like that, again, it speaks to where his heart is and what he actually believes. He spews this all this kind of nonsense all the time. And everyone just goes, yeah, okay, whatever. It seems to be all right. What? So the fact that there would be black Americans, because there's there's been a bunch of articles out there. And I think some of this is planted by the Trump people because I know mm -hmm. that they've that they've been talking about they want to make inroads because they did make a two percent increase from 2016 to 2020 with the black vote, which is crazy. I you often use the statistic about Philadelphia, that Trump got 20% more of the black vote in Philadelphia in 2020 than he did in 2016. Um, and why? Well, cognitive dissonance is a hell of a drug, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, mis um, machismo and misogyny are very real. There is a, most of this movement is coming from black men. And these are black men with grievance, no different than white men with grievance who support Donald Trump. They have a grievance and they are attracted to Donald Trump um, claiming to be their champion. And that is a very powerful tool. And Trump knows that. So there's and there's also a certain amount of that celebrity, the rich celebrity, whether that's a, a facade, because right, we all know that Trump's not as he's not as rich as he claims. A lot of it's a facade. He's a terrible businessman, but it doesn't matter. He spent decades building that that facade up, and people, you know, who don't pay attention all the time or who are uninterested in, you know, critical thinking, on the surface, they're like that. Donald Trump is cool, and you know, yeah, he's a tough guy, and he's going to take care of me, and and this is problematic because the Democratic Party has taken the black vote for granted in a lot of areas, mm -hmm. and the election is going to be really, really close again. And they cannot take that Democratic coalition for granted. One or two percentage points can make the difference here. So I think there is a red flag. The alarms are going off for Democrats that they cannot take this for granted. Biden has lost some of the black vote, younger black voters. The older black voters who also are higher propensity voters, too, they actually do vote. Younger black voters don't vote at the same rate. But still, we need everybody to, to do that, to, to get out there and vote. Um, he has lost some of some of that that demographic right now for a couple of reasons. One, again, we're back to the Israeli Hamas Palestinian issue. There is this certain, you know, it's complicated, but there is a certain um, uh, 
the, the black community feels a certain relationship to the Palestinians. And so oftentimes they are more pro-Palestinian than they are is Israel. That has an impact. Um, that's I think that's impacting the, this polling right now concerning Biden and, and younger black voters. Also, economics. You know, there's people feel as though they were more economically stable under Trump. And this is no different than what's happening in some, you know, white communities, too. But for blacks, they were like, wait, hold on. We, you know, we had they got the covid money. Their small businesses were were funded. Um, gas prices were lower. And they're like, well, we were better off economically under that guy. And it's like, yeah, but <laughs> you don't understand what at a at what it costs and b what contributed to that. You know, COVID screwed everything up. But so there's there's certain things that the people have to they don't remember the bad stuff about Trump that impacts them directly. But he says it's, it, Tara, every single day. So if you're does, if you're a black and male, it are two different things, though. Understood. You know what? But, you know what I mean? People, it's how a, they people feel. But Tara, if you're a black um, American and you hear a guy who wants to be the president of the United States talking about how he could have resolved, then we all know exactly what he means by it. He could yeah. have resolved the the civil war in 24 hours. He doesn't think much of you, and yet you're still going to support him. If you are a female, after his acceptance of his own self-laudatory congratulation that he single-handedly upended a 50-year starry decisis decision of Roe mm -hmm. versus Wade, and you are mm -hmm. a female, and you are holding up a sign that says, vote Trump, you, young lady, are a fucking idiot. You, Mr. Yep, or Mrs. Pretty much. Black American, who is voting for Donald Trump, who would truly make the statement that I have no problem with black people, everyone should own them. That's a Donald Trump statement. Then you, yep. Mr. or Mrs. Black American, are a fucking idiot. The Hispanic You're voting community. against your own self-interest. You are. Right. You're voting against your own self-interest. And, 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 you know, as a, you know, as a minority Republican for many years, I used to have to battle with people who couldn't understand how I would be a Republican based off of some of the racist uh, history of Republicans. And, and I would, I would say that, you know, that wasn't everyone, you know, the principles of, of conservatism or something that I believed in that I thought had better policy solutions just because the messengers were fallible didn't mean that there was no merit to conservatism. I used to have to battle my democratic friends over that, but now it's not the same. It, the dynamic is not the same. We're not talking about policies. We're talking about basic decency and the viewpoint that black Americans uh, could have been negotiated in slavery, less than human, like owning people, like chattel. <laughs> and how, chattel. Like, that's right, chattel. Like this is, and, and Donald Trump is, we're, we're relitigating this in 2024. This is actually a conversation. No, there is, this is not about policy. This is not a difference between whether there should be public private partnerships and welfare uh, or how many, you know, tax credits you should get for small businesses or minority diversity projects. Okay. No, 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 no. We're talking about fundamental human rights here. Absolutely. That's a huge difference. And so, you know, I, I, like I said, cognitive dissonance is a hell of a drug. There are always those people that will be sympathizers um, to their, the, you know, for people that they, that hate them. And we, you know, we saw it in, yep. that's correct. You know, yep. there's always going to be those, but black women are still very, very supportive of, uh, solidly supportive of Joe Biden. Um, older black Americans are solidly supportive of Joe Biden. He still has a nine to one, eight to one advantage over Trump when it comes to black Americans. Um, but if they stay home, versus, you know, I don't think they're going to go and vote for Trump necessarily. I mean, you're going to have some, but the ones that feel that they're going to stay home because they're like, oh, it doesn't matter or they're the same. And that's, those are the people that really need to take a strong, hard look at, you know, what, what they're, what the implications of that will be. So Tara, look, we know that President Biden has been trying to fix the issues with immigration uh, and the border, literally. And this is something a lot of people don't know. Since day one in office. Yeah. Now, I want to just, from a historical perspective, talk about the fact that the border immigration has been an issue now for over five, six decades. 
Mm -hmm. right. This didn't happen because Joe Biden came into office. The difference, though, (laughs) Republicans, Republicans have somehow managed to blame the entire border crisis on Joe Biden. So my question to you, Tara, how do Democrats turn this narrative around? First of all, it should it sounds like it should be easy because it's fundamentally flawed. It is a lie. It is inaccurate. But nevertheless, Republicans have seized the message and we need to figure out how to turn that message around. How do you do it? Well, well, um, there is some there's blame to go around here for everybody. When I worked in Capitol Hill for seven years, um, immigration was part of my portfolio. So I'm very intimately familiar with the problems, with the political um, expediency of not wanting to fix those problems. And Republicans recognized that the power of the fear factor concerning immigration was a very powerful motivator for their constituents. So any opportunity for people who were negotiating in good faith on both sides to try to get an immigration deal on whether it was guest worker programs or E-Verify or the Secure the Fence Act or some type of comprehensive immigration reform with visas, um, with uh, you know stronger border security, hiring more border agents or whatever, Republicans would ultimately blow it up because it was to their political advantage to keep the issue out there. Every single time Republicans would get into a, a, a rut or they were desperate to change the subject because Donald Trump was doing something insane or whatever, or Democrats were doing good things, all of a sudden there's a caravan. There's Fox News and everyone going down to the border, showing pictures of the border chaos or, mm-hmm. you know, the border issue would come up and immigrants would be the, you know, were demonized. Now, Is the border system broken? Yes. Do we have a problem at the border? Absolutely. Could more have been done by the Biden administration when they got into office to fix this? Yes. And they should have been more aggressive earlier on. There's a reason they recognize that this was going to be a problem, which is why they tried to push Title 42 as long as they could, which is what kept it was the the health emergency that kept a lot of the uh, uh, illegal immigrants out and in Mexico because of a health emergency. But eventually, once the COVID health emergency was lifted, there was no legal basis anymore for the Biden administration to keep that in place because it worked. But the remain in Mexico issues and, and trying to fix the asylum system, because yes, a lot of them are taking advantage of the asylum system. It's broken. Um, catch and release is a problem. Our border agents are overwhelmed. We don't have the capacity but we shouldn't be separating families and putting kids in cages. There is some, there are ways around having to do this in a way that is either really c- cruel and inhuman or just kind of like kicking the can down the road. So how do, what do we do? Well, there are points that the Republicans are making about things that can be done down at the border that are valid. And Democrats need to, they need to, they need to finally understand that there's going to have to be some tough decisions made here. Enough is enough is enough. The average American looks at what's happening at the border and they say they could have a heart for immigrants. You don't have, you don't have to be a xenophobe to be like, you know, because you want to see order at the border. No, but the average American looks at that and goes, no, something's got to be done here. And that's why the Biden administration was trying to, in good faith, negotiate with some Republicans to get a deal done in exchange for support for Ukraine and and support for Israel and what they needed done as well. I'm skeptical that they will ever reach a deal because Republicans have no incentive to give Biden a win because that's what they've said it. I don't know, it was Clay Higgins, somebody recently, what these Republicans said it. They're like, we're not going to give Biden that political win. These are people's lives. These, this is the you know livelihoods of people along the border. These are, you know, these are immigrants who are coming here for a better life. Most of them are good and decent people okay. that just want a better life okay. here. So but then just do it the right way. Do it the, right, do it the way. right way. Exactly. To give create a, an incentive structure that allows them to do it the right way. Because right now you, you can get here the wrong way and stay here. That's why they keep doing it. There's no consequence. So the Biden administration, there are things they could do immediately. Um, negotiating a remain in Mexico fixing the asylum system, stopping this catch and release nonsense, 
And, you know, and, and it's a little tough and the immigration advocates on the on the Democratic side don't like it, but they're going to have to get over it because this is this is a this is a problem for the Biden administration. And they've got to show that they see they recognize this and that the American people want something done. So, so we'll see what they can do. Sure. So then let me ask you, what do you see as the former Republican? What do you see as the future of the Republican Party, especially <laughs> especially assuming that Trump ends up winning the nomination. I'm I'm oh, completely yeah. blown away that he will most probably get the nomination. There's, oh no, he will. Know, <laughs> Come on, he, there's no most unless probably. He has, unless, unless he, he has dead. a heart attack, right? Right. Unless he has exactly. a heart attack, no, or he ends up he ends up in prison, which I'm still not sure won't win him the nomination. I know, but, I know, what, but that's not going to happen see? before the election. Well, what do you see, Look, uh, Michael? We you know we've had this conversation many times and. The Republican Party is a shell of itself. It should it 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 should really burn to the ground and we should start changing the name. Because if they allow Donald Trump to become the nominee, God forbid he wins again. Um these are not Republicans. They're fascists and they're illiberal populists. And it's the the Republican Party has been dead and gone for quite some time now, but really dead and gone since they didn't impeach him over January 6th. Once January 6th happened, that should have been it for Donald Trump. Should they can make been. every excuse before, you know, they could make every excuse before that policies, tax cuts, whatever the fuck. January 6th was a direct attack on our constitution and our peaceful transfer of power, which used to be something that was Republican orthodoxy. It was it was something that Republicans in their pocket constitutions and their constitutional sanctimony, these were supposed to be unmovable principles. And they demonstrated that nothing is sacred. They believe in nothing. They're nihilists. So what's the future of the party? Yeah. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the party should burn to the ground because it does it's it's it does not represent what what Repub the history of who Republicans are and what they believe in, because this is not the same Republican Party, and we're not just talking about the difference in tax rates. This is our fundamental shift away from liberal democracy, period. And I want no part of it. And I think that the people who think that there's still normies left, who are they? You could fit them in a canoe. Yeah. Because every one of them, even the ones that say, well, we should move on from Donald Trump. Move on, you think? You know, but 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 I'll still endorse him though. But he's, you know, he's better than Biden. Get the fuck out of here. Really? They 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 have no sense of moral clarity. They are morally bankrupt. And I I just don't know as a major party, I think it's unfortunate that it's 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 dying from within here but the malignancy of trumpism has destroyed the republican party and it will never recover as long as any of these people are still are still in power it will take a, a new group of middle of the road folks mm -hmm. like myself and others who are politically homeless now to possibly maybe start something new or get a movement together but um i don't see the republican party being a serious party or ever regaining the the glory days of reagan or bush or you know people for, for those of us who who were proud of those presidencies um i don't ever see that the republican party going back there ever so then look the hour goes by very quickly here on mea culpa <laughs> i say it on every show because yeah it, it does i have a million more questions i'd like to ask you but i do want to end it by asking you this what does the lincoln project have in store for this election year and more importantly how can we support Lincoln Project, not just support Lincoln Project, to grow? You know, it's something that I talk about, not just on this podcast, but on my live one with Ben Micellis, where we do mm -hmm. political beatdown. Uh, it's a YouTube yeah. sensation. And we constantly talk about how we're growing the community. And the purpose of growing the community is so that our voices can never be drowned out by these maggot morons that whether they want to just obsess on x on 
formerly Twitter or on any of the other social media platforms with their misinformation, disinformation, malinformation campaigns. But we're putting out ads. We're trying to reach the masses one person at a time with less mm -hmm. than 11 months to go. That's a very tough ask. So let me just again ask yeah. you, what is Lincoln Project, who I think their ads are phenomenal, what do you guys have in store? Yeah, I you know, we we appreciate that that this pro democracy movement has um gained traction and gained more and more people recognizing that this is the fundamental issue uh, going into 2024. So it's great to have so many allies now. Um you know, all these organizations didn't exist when Lincoln Project first started out in 2020. And so it's it's really cool to see how this whole movement has grown. And I, I think what's what what you're gonna see from us is, you know, we are we have a very specific set of skills and what we're good at when it comes to messaging. And with our ads being targeted in the six states that will determine the next election, um, we will have, you know, the same pointed messaging the same hard hitting ads and imagery. Uh, you've got Rick and I on on the breakdown on our on our Lincoln Project YouTube show that we do on Thursdays, similar to uh, what you guys are doing, where we we break down what's happening, we put the truth out there, and we arm mm -hmm. and educate people because there are more of us and there are of them. I say this all the time, but people have to feel activated mm -hmm. and motivated and amplify these messages. Amplification is important retweet our stuff, repost our stuff. Um, you know, if you feel so inclined to dedicate, you know, to donate money to help us expand and grow, please do that too. We would love it. Um, but that that's what it's going to take. It takes amplification. It takes activation. It takes yep. engagement and getting people um, inspired to go out there and either, you know, volunteer for campaigns, um, speak to your neighbors, make sure you get people out there to vote. Like it's going to take a collective effort from all of us. Um, and so you're going to see a heavy presence for, by Lincoln Project with with all of our ads and with our messaging and, and getting that out there and partnering with other organizations to amplify the message because it's going to take all of us to do it. Well, you know, I'm in. Anything that you're involved <laughs> with, Tara, you know that I'm in. By the way, your friend with Thank his you, indictments, uh, you know, yes. th those indictments, it was a yes. big hit. It was a big hit in the Palm Beach area. Oh, you know? I First love all, it. You know. um, yeah. I have to. I'll send it. I'll send a message to Blue and let yeah, him know. Please, so our a friend do. of the Lincoln Project, he started these mints, like literal mints. They're called indictments, and he has different flavors, and they're very. It's very clever. So, so guys, Google them was, and check them way, out. It was <laughs> a big hit in Palm Beach. Just the I love it. But I Tara, love it. Love you. Thank you so much for joining me again for helping me to spread the word, uh, or me helping you guys to spread the word. Likewise, my friend. Truly appreciate you. Likewise, my friend. We got to get you on the breakdown. Anytime, you know I'm there. <laughs> I'll see you soon.